So I will talk about the introduction to regression analysis as far as this is needed to understand the techniques we will introduce to identify causal relationships later. As it turns out, the actual tool of running regressions is at the core of almost everything we do when we do um, any sort of causal inference. So <laughs> let's introduce that tool. We'll start by thinking about how regression analysis allows us to, to quantify relationships between two or more variables. In fact, <clears throat> our first step will be just looking at one variable. It will be a, a very special type of relationship, but also quite important. And then we'll discuss that we can use this, actually the regression framework to implement hypothesis tests in a very convenient way. But the important thing which we have discussed already is that if you run a relationship by a, a regression model, by itself, there's absolutely no guarantee that the relationship which it describes is actually a causal relationship. And the important thing is for you to understand that when you start study causal inference, that the actual techniques of running regression is really, really easy. Okay, you can do it in Excel and all sorts of software. Sometimes you just need to push a button. It's really easy. What is really difficult is to interpret the results correctly. And that will have to be your skill. So here's the first example we're going to look at. With the well-being data, which we have used before, we will run a simple regression. But what we're going to do is we're going to filter the data to only filter the British data and only for the 2008-2010 wave. Okay, and we do that with this filter function. That is the country variable, that is the wave variable, and that equal equal sign basically says filter the data, so keep the data where the country variable is equal to Great Britain and where the wave variable is equal to 2008-2010. So we only have a subset of data here. Um, in fact, the result here is 997 observations. You will see that actually from the next slide. So that means we have 997 individuals which responded to the survey in Britain in that wave. What we're now going to do is we're going to take that A170 variable, that's the life satisfaction variable, and we run a regression. But we run a really simple regression. We have as a dependent variable on the left-hand side, life satisfaction, and on the right-hand side, we have nothing but a constant and an error term. Now that constant is re really, you can think about this as here being alpha times a one for each observation. Okay, so that's why we have a constant. And so when you run this regression, how we call that is with the LM function for linear models. Then we have to the left of that little squiggly thing, we have our life satisfaction variable. And to the right, we have everything that's on the right hand side, everything we use to explain variation in life satisfaction. So in this case, we are really only using one, a constant. So that's where this one comes from. And the way how you use the LM function is you tell where your data reside. They reside in test data. Test data is what we created up here, our filtered data set. So if we then use the uh, stargazer function to uh, um, to look at the results, so we saved everything in mod one, 
you could either use, you could also use the summary function. So you could say summary mod one, or you can use stargazer. Mod one. Look at the um, the extra file with the details on the on the code to see how that works. So here we have the results. When we estimate estimate this model, we will get sample estimates for some coefficients. Here we only have one coefficient. We only have that alpha. So we're getting a sample estimate for that alpha. We don't know the true alpha. That's a population parameter and we're getting a sample estimate. And here is our sample estimate. So this is going to be alpha hat. Okay, that is going to be 7.530. It turns out that this is really, if we run this very special regression where we only have a constant, this alpha hat is equal to the sample mean. Okay, so that means on average our British respondents in 2008 responded to the life satisfaction question with a value of 7.53. So that's how we interpret this, um, this output. Now there's a second important output here and that is this guy 0.63. That turns out is the standard error of alpha hat. Okay, so that's therefore the standard error of our sample estimate. We learned before that we could look at sample means also using the t-test function. Uh, we did that in the lecture. And if you call the t-test trying to test the hypothesis that the mean to the British answers to the satisfaction question is equal to zero, note that doesn't make sense because the A170 question will de deliver responses between uh, not zero, but the smallest value is one, two, all the way up to 10. So we know we should be rejecting this null hypothesis. So we can use the t.test dot dot test function to test this. What we get here is the sample mean. The t.test function will give us the sample mean. That is exactly the same value we get here, 7.53. And it also delivers what is our t-test to test for a sample mean. Now this t-test is also, we can also calculate from the above regression output if we take our alpha hat and divide by the standard error of alpha hat. So if we do that here, our alpha hat is 7.530 from here, 7.530 divided by 0 0.063, divided by 0 0.063. And the result of this is gonna be 119.5 so this is very close to the value which we got here and the only reason that we have a difference here is because you can see the sample mean is actually 7.5 uh, 7.5295 at 9 and we had this rounded here to three digits okay so the difference is really only rounding errors so we get this t-test so you can use the regression output to calculate such a t-test. So clearly in this case we also have a p-value 
and that is very, very small. Remember how we interpret p-values, they are the probability of receiving a sample like this, a sample with an average of 7.5 to 9, if in truth the population mean was zero. The probability of this happening is minute, is basically zero, and therefore we reject this null hypothesis. So all I want to show with this is we can really use a regression model to calculate very simple hypothesis tests. Let's move to a slightly more interesting example. We are now trying to explain variation in life satisfaction with variation in income. So we are still having 997 observations. Actually, I wanted to point out where we can get this from. That information is here, 997 observations. And now we are running this regression where we explain variation in life satisfaction. That's the A170 question with, again, a constant and variation in income. And that X of 47D, that is the income variable. You can look in the uh, one of the early slides with a list of variables. So now, once we run the regression, we will, running this regression, will deliver sample estimates for alpha, so alpha hat, and sample estimates for beta, beta hat. How would we interpret a particular value for beta? It will tell us how much we should expect life satisfaction to increase if income increases by a particular amount. We'll look at the next slide. We'll look at the output. Okay, so here again we run this and we save this in a new object mod 1 and then we are using the stargazer function stargazer mod 1 comma type text so you can read it nicely um, to produce this output. So now we have a constant and that is going to be alpha hat and we have our beta hat here. So what we see here is that we have a coefficient of 0.184. So how do we interpret this? Here's the interpretation. As the income increases by one unit, and you can look at the information, income is measured in 1,000 euros. So one unit meaning an increase of 1,000 euros. We should expect that life satisfaction increases by 0.184. So our suspicion that on average people with higher income will have higher life satisfaction is confirmed by this, by this estimate. So we can again ask whether we think this is significant. So we could ask the question whether in truth the beta is equal to zero to the alternative that beta is unequal to zero. See here, that one makes sense because a beta of zero would imply that there is no relationship between income and life satisfaction. So that's a perfectly sensible hypothesis. So we will again use a t-test. That will be of this hypothesis. That will be our coefficient value, 0.84 divided by the standard error, 0.039. So you can calculate yourself how much that is, but that will be, I don't have a calculator handy, I would have to switch the screen, but you can see that this will be around 4.5. That is the t-test. And the p-value, well, exactly we can't tell this. We could look to a table or you could actually use R to calculate the exact p-value. But this is where the stars now come in to give us some information. Three stars indicate that the p-value is smaller than 
1%. And this would indicate that most likely, depending on our proposed significance level, we will reject this null hypothesis because if in truth that beta value was zero, the true beta value was zero, the probability of getting a sample which indicates such a strong positive relationship is smaller than 1%. If you think about regressions, especially simple regression, uh, represented graphically by a line in a scatter plot, then we can look at our data in our scatter plot and what we will be able to see, and these are this is our scatter plot, it is jittered so that not all income sorry, not all life satisfaction responses and income responses come in on one line so we can actually see how many points there are. This blue line is the line that represents our regression output. So our estimated regression line here is life satisfaction the estimated value of that is equal to 7.190 that's the constant plus 0.184 times income and that line with an intercept of 7.19 and a slope of 0.184 that is this blue line the estimated regression line and it shows you a positive slope because that is what our sample of data suggests if we want to fit the line the, the line with the best fit in here it will show a positive slope so you would have most likely learned about regression analysis being a way or a tool to find out which line actually fits the best. There are lots of alternative alternative lines, okay? Perhaps we could have this light, this light blue line, or perhaps we could have a, um, a green line here. Perhaps it's a flat line or even slightly negative. So what regression analysis is, is it finds you that line, and that's what you would have learned, that in some sense minimizes the distance between individual points, like this one here, and the line, or this one and the line. So we have lots of these distances, in fact 997, and we want to find the line where the distance is the smallest. Now how would we define distance as a very particular there was a very particular definition and that is here the first interpretation it is the regression line as characterized by alpha hat and beta hat that minimizes the residual sum of squares now the residual sum of squares are exactly these differences we, between individual points and the regression line. And then we square these differences and sum them up. So we square these differences and then we sum them up. That's what this summation sign here is for all 997 observations. And we find the alpha and the beta that minimizes that sum of squared residuals and that's why regression analysis linear regression analysis is sometimes called OLS ordinary least squares we're finding the least squares so that's one interpretation what regression analysis does but I'd like to introduce a second interpretation that in some sense will be much more meaningful for what comes later Again, you can think of 
a regression analysis being a tool that finds the regression line by changing alpha hat and beta hat that ensures that the residuals the residuals are our observations minus that regression line so these residuals will find that alpha hat and that beta hat which changes the residuals right because alpha hat and beta hat are in this uh, definition and that makes these uncorrelated with the explanatory variables here income okay so this is perhaps not so intuitive okay so let's think about this for a, a short while let me go back to here let me also write down our regression equation, okay, which was life satisfaction, which was equal to a constant plus beta times income plus an error term. So in some sense, what we're doing is we're decomposing variation in life satisfaction into two parts into this green bit which is uh, what we will also call the explained bit and into the red bit which is the unexplained bit okay that's the error term and what we want is we want these two bits to be different and we don't want anything that we can explain to end up in the unexplained bit in the error term okay in here we want to have everything we cannot explain And then in the green bit, this is our explained bit. Okay, that's the explained part. What we want is that this bit is uncorrelated with this bit. Because if there was a relation between the two, that would indicate that we could move some of the stuff that happens in the unexplained bit into the explained bit because after all they would be correlated that means there would be a relationship and that means we could explain some of this so we want there to be no relationship between these two and therefore what we do when we have our when we have our regression equation this here expresses the green bit, the explained bit. Which means that we will be decomposing our observations for life satisfaction into the explained bit, which is going to be life satisfaction hat, the explained bit and an unexplained bit, bit our u hat okay so we have the explained bit and the unexplained bit and we want these two guys to be uncorrelated and this is what basically we have here we have u hat which is life satisfaction so we can just we can change this we can do a little bit of algebra and express this as 
life satisfaction minus the explained bit is equal to u hat. So this is how we calculate u hat. Life satisfaction, the observed observation, minus the explained value. So that's what you see here as you as you had. And we want this to be uncorrelated with all explanatory variables, with everything that appears in the green bit. Okay, and in the green bit we have basically our one variable here, income. So we want u hat to be uncorrelated to income. So the second interpretation, therefore, is that what a regression analysis does is it chooses the alpha hat and the beta hat such that the u hat is uncorrelated with the explanatory variable here in this case, that is income. So that's very important to understand. That this will always happen. Okay, so the U hat regression analysis, an outcome of it is that U hat and inc income are uncorrelated. So let's go back to our original regression model. When we do regression analysis, it turns out we have to make a number of assumptions. We have to assume that this model is true. All the parameters here, alpha and beta, have to appear linearly uh, in the model, and as more on that in next week's lecture. And one of the core assumptions, which of course Martin will talk about again, but I will anticipate it here, is that the income variable, the explained var explanatory variable on the right hand side, is exogenous. And what that means is we want and we need to assume that the unobserved error terms u are uncorrelated with the explanatory variable income in this case. And if that's the case, we call income an exogenous variable. Okay, so we want the covariance, or that implies the correlation between income and u to be equal to zero. So what did we just say on the previous slide? We said that correlation analysis implies that, sorry, regression analysis implies that the correlation between income and u hat is equal to zero. So all regression analysis will ensure that this is true. If that is so, well, how does that relate to this assumption? The assumption saying we want the correlation of income and u to be equal to zero. So the important thing to understand is that u and u hat are not the same thing. Okay, u is not the same thing as u hat. u hat is the regression residual we see once we found a particular regression line. Say here the blue line. Once we have that blue line, we can calculate that regression residual. But if we had chosen a different line, for instance the green line, then the regression residual would be this one here. So the regression residual you had really depends on your parameter estimates alpha hat and beta hat. However, the u value, that is our true unobserved error term. So we will not see it. And that is why we have to make this assumption. You have to assume that this is the case. You cannot test that because we don't know what the true u is. As we said before, in a particular sample, we, or a regression analysis, will ensure that this bit is always true. Okay, by construction, by the way, the alpha hat and the beta hat are found. 
but importantly that's not the same as this okay these are different things these two and this we need to ins uh, assume that income is uncorrelated to the unobserved error term so there will be much more focus on this exogeneity assumption in what comes in the next few weeks what actually happens underneath the hood when you do a regression analysis in some sense that is most likely repetition of what you already know here is again our regression analysis uh, sorry our regression model now let me rewrite this in a notation that perhaps looks more familiar to you y is equal to alpha plus beta times x plus u okay so that's when we use the generic terms y for the dependent variable and the generic term x for the explanatory variable so what happens if we call our regression model as before so that was the y variable that's the x variable if you do this the regression analysis as a result will spit out these sample estimates alpha hat and beta hat and you may remember that there are formulas for this the sample covariance between y and x okay and i use that hat to indicate that this is a sample term and the sample variance divided by the sample variance of x that gave beta hat and alpha hat perhaps you're familiar with the term y hat minus beta hat times x bar sorry y bar the sample average of y minus beta hat times x bar the sample average of x so basically what the software will do is nothing else but calculating needs to calculate four things the covariance between y and x the variance of x the sample mean of y and the sample mean of x and then we can estimate these two values and that's basically all that happens inside that lm function now this is a very important point these two sample estimates which we get beta hat and alpha hat they are really what we call random variables okay alpha hat and beta hat are random variables why is that so now we need to do just a little bit of algebra here is again our formula for beta hat it's the same formula here it's covariance of xy divided by variance of x just now with our variable names the variable names of our particular example life satisfaction and income now what we're going to do is we replace life satisfaction with our regression model okay with this model so we replace for life satisfaction in this equation here which we'll is substitute what we have on the right hand side here okay including the alpha so in the formula for the covariance what we now have is alpha plus beta times income plus u yeah, because that green bit that's what we've just replaced then we use a little bit of algebra rules for calculating with covariances so this covariance it's a covariance of a sum with income will be the sum of the covariance of each of these individual terms so we have alpha so we get the covariance of alpha and income that's what we have here then we have 
the beta times income. So we get covariance of beta times income times income. And beta is a constant, so we can get this out of the covariance operator. So you need to know your covariance calculation rules. And we have the u here. So we get the covariance of u with income. That's what we have here. And the sum of all of these terms is still divided by the variance of income. So what do we have here? That red term, covariance of alpha, which is a constant term with income. So we have the covariance of a constant term with an income. That guy is just plain and simple going to be zero. A constant term cannot have a covariance with anything. So that bit is zero. So we are left with this green and blue bit uh, here, both divided by variance of income. Now here we have the covariance of income with income. That is the same as the variance of income or the sample variance of income. So here we have really beta times the variance of income. So that's what we have here. Beta times the variance of income. And here we still have the covariance of u and income. So both of these terms, we have two summons here. So we'll just separate the summons, but make sure that both are divided by variance of income. So we have beta times variance of income divided by variance of income plus covariance of u and income divided by variance of income. Clearly, this and this cancels out. So here, the first time, we are just left with beta. So what we have here is beta hat is the true beta, which of course we don't know, plus a term which is determined by the sample covariance of u and income divided by the variance of income. So this guy here, the u, this is a random variable. These are our random error terms. Now, if on the right-hand side we have a random variable, then on the left-hand side, that guy here is also going to be a random variable. So beta hat is a function of a random term u, and hence is itself a random variable. So beta hat is a random variable. Once we have estimated life satisfaction and income, uh, the covariance between life satisfaction and income in the sample, and the variance of income, and we replace these, so once we replace these with sample estimates, what we get is one value. Okay, we get one value which is drawn from a random distribution. So our one sample estimate beta hat is a draw from a random distribution. So beta hat is really follows a random distribution because of this guy here on the right hand side. Okay, this is the guy. As this is a random variable, this is going to be a random variable here. And once we calculate our one value, we need to recognize that this is a draw from a random distribution. Think about holding a dice in your hand before you roll it, you know the outcome will follow a random distribution. With equal probability, it will take values 1 to 6. Once you rolled it, you have one value, say 4. That one value we, draw, we call a draw from that random distribution. So the one sample value you get for beta hat is a draw from a random distribution. Now, you may think this is all pretty, um, pretty abstract uh, stuff, but it turns out that it's super important. Okay. So, it's important, and making this initial assumption 
about that random variable u, i.e. that it's not correlated with the income observations. The issue is the income variable, that we can see, but the u, that is unobservable. So that's an x for not observable. So that means we can't actually measure this and therefore we have to make assumptions. Now what's the problem if this assumption does not hold true? And we will talk a lot about situations where it doesn't hold true. But we, need to, we will need to think about it. But the consequences are that if we estimate the model by OLS, then we are essentially imposing an incorrect relationship. So why is this? Go back to the two interpretations of a regression model we had. We said that one interpretation, the second one of a regression model, estimating a regression model is that it imposes that our sample error term and income are uncorrelated. Okay, so it imposes this guy here. But if really in truth income and you are correlated, then we have imposed something which isn't right. <coughs> so that's the first consequence. The second being that the estimated coefficients alpha and beta hat, beta hat turn out to be what we call biased. Okay, that means on average On average, we get an incorrect value. What we really want is when we estimate these values, we want that on average we get it right. So that's a pretty uh, bad place to be. That's why imposing this assumption and hoping that it's right, or perhaps doing more than hoping, is very important. And the last point which sort of follows from both of these points is that in that case a regression model has no causal interpretation. Okay, in that case we cannot interpret the estimated value for beta as indicating how a change in income causes a change in life satisfaction. And that's why so far we've always been careful in only talking about related to, in related to terms. That the beta hat indicates to us that income is related to life satisfaction. And I was always very careful in not saying causes changes in life satisfaction. So, of course, as this U guy is unobserved, okay, we cannot observe the UIs, this assumption of exogeneity cannot actually be tested, at least not in a straightforward manner. And the way how we will go about this is that we'll need to make economic arguments, so using our understanding of particular situations, to make an argument of whether we believe this assumption is fulfilled or not. So, as I said before, lots of what we will do for the remainder of this course is around this assumption, because it is so absolutely crucial to making causal statements, and that's what we are after. And if you want to use regression analysis to make causal statement, you have to be convinced that this assumption is true. We will also deal with situations where we have to concede, thinking about the situation, that this assumption will not be true. But we will give you some tools to still 
recover causal interpretations. And diff in diff, the setup we talked about before, is one of these sort of tools we will um, we will give you. You should also anticipate the following to happen. We talked about simple regression analysis here. Why was explained with one explanatory variable. We will deal with situations where we have more than one explanatory variable. And that will be fairly straightforward, especially in, in terms of calculating it. R will do it easily. That has an advantage in the sense that including more relevant explanatory variables can make the exogeneity assumption more plausible. So perhaps this assumption doesn't sound very plausible for un if we only have one explanatory variable, but perhaps adding two or three more will help our case. But there will be situations where even with more explanatory variable, this exogeneity assumption will be implausible and then we will need to find other tools to make it plausible. Now it will turn out that one way of doing so is to find another variable for which this exogeneity assumption is plausible. And we will talk about this. This will be um, instrumental variables, for instance. Um, but we'll leave more detail for later. Even when we are looking at tools to deal with situations where the exogeneity assumption is not plausible, it will turn out that often the solution will still involve some sort of regression analysis, just a very clever one. So there is lots for you to look forward to. And um, I hope you do.